Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today's uh, meeting C++ London Uni, uh, we'll be talking about uh, TDD. It's a week two of our assignment. But before we get there, a uh, few words of... Uh, uh, how do I use that? A uh, few words of for the beginning. Uh, Oli, how do I use this? Which one? Okay, so first of all, a uh, massive thank you to our uh, sponsor that is allowing us to use the space. It's Mimecast. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much for the pizza and some refreshments. Uh, very, very amazing. Uh, without you, this class obviously wouldn't happen. So a massive thank you. Another place to say a massive thank you is to people who decided to pay on a regular basis some money to us. Uh, thanks to them, as you can see now, I got like a really nice mic, so I'm talking to this, uh, Oli got mics and so on. So all of that is basically purchased uh, through uh, people who uh, provide the money. Uh, but as well, we have uh, Vladimir who help us with some uh, stickers, so some of them. If anybody wants some stickers, let me know. I got stickers with me, I forgot just to take them out of the bag. So. Wear them proudly, spread them across, let people ask you what is it, so my, they may come to us. Uh, we are still looking for a new home. The good news is, <coughs> uh, by the look of it, I have secured a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ahead, uh, which is nice. So one extra, uh, I think uh, we got one extra at Mimecast. Then we have a couple of floors up, same building at Primal Base. Uh, and we're trying to get a couple of other places. So hopefully we will have like at least a month full of uh, space secure. But we do honestly look for space because it's really, really difficult. <coughs> so if I have to spend like a day or more of my time, you know, chasing people going, it's a very, very difficult task. As you know, we are volunteers. We have to do other stuff. Uh, so, you know, do help us because, you know, this way you can we ensure that the classes actually do happen. Uh, so where we are, uh, obviously we start the test-driven development uh, and then after that is introduction to templates and after that we have we selected a date on 10th of September for the new course. So basically we'll start from complete zero. So if you don't know anything about C++, that's probably the best time to join us. But if you do, if you're one of our students, you don't have to stop, yes? You can come in, help the, the, the newcomers as well. That will help you to learn uh, as well better because you suddenly start seeing stuff from the position of the teacher, at least at the beginning. And later, we'll go through the courses and you keep learning. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm going through all of the courses and I do learn always something new. So, you know, uh, we encourage you to stay. Uh, how our classes are structured? <coughs> uh, well, we have pretty much two days. Uh, Tuesdays, which is lecture, so uh, Oliver, Tristan, or some uh, guest uh, teacher will explain something in extremely basic terms that when you, at the end of the lesson, you think like you know everything, uh, but to ensure that actually you do, on Thursdays, we advise you to go and actually put that knowledge to test. So uh, please do RSVP for both of the events, so we know that you're coming, so <laughs> uh, we can prepare ourselves and turn up, otherwise we'll go for to, to pub directly. Uh, if anybody of you need a license, do let me know, send me an email. <coughs> uh, uh, in the subject, put C Lion license, and just put your name and your details inside the email. I'll quickly copy, paste, reply, and, and basically send you a six month license for uh, C Lion. It's, a, it's an excellent, one of the best, uh, probably one of the best, IDs. It's a commercial product, but because you're our students and JetBrains like us, so they give us the, the licenses for free. <laughs> uh, if you decide that you would like to support us, uh, there are the ways. Uh, so first one, as I mentioned uh, earlier, is Patreon. It's basically if you if you work, if you if you full work, yes, so you paid salary, uh, and if you decide that it would be worth idea good idea to spend some money on us <laughs> because you, it brings you some joy or promotion or something like that. Go to Patreon and you can set up. We set a couple of, couple of you know, <laughs> levels, but you can choose your own, whatever you feel comfortable with. 
Uh, the most interesting, obviously, would be to get a sponsor, a company X, that will say, like, guys, you're amazing. So we will help you. Either we'll provide you with a space or we'll <coughs> give you some money so you can buy the, the equipment and so on uh, and help us this way. Uh, but as well, there's a much smaller way. So once the class is finished, uh, make sure Oliver, Tristan, and whoever is the, the teacher are basically looked after. So when we go to pub afterwards, make sure that they get a couple of beers, yeah, they got something, some food. Well, today we have pizza, so it's not critical. But at least today they will get a couple of beers, yes? And the thing is, if one person just turn up for a pub and have to buy two, three beers for two people, that's quite expensive. But if you turn up as a group, you don't even notice. <coughs> uh, as well, share stuff about us on social media. Whatever you want. Just, just, just write about us, link to us, and so on, so other people can find us. Because I keep finding people who say, like, oh, I never heard of you. How long have you been here? Uh, and we've been pretty much almost two years, yes? Well, in September will be two years. So time flies quick. But there's so many people who don't know we exist. So that's all from me. Uh, I forgot one extra thing, which is basically introduce us, who we are. So my name is Tom, <laughs> Tom Breza. I am one of the hosts. Oliver Dean is today's uh, leading teacher, and behind there, uh, Tristan is uh, 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 trying to get some pizza. So that's all from me. Uh, by the way, if you have a questions, uh, we will pass your mic so people on YouTube can hear you. So that's all from me. Uh, I'm stopping telling the boring stuff, and I'm passing you to Oli. All right, if everyone on the stream just stands by, we're going to switch the audio source without uh, murdering your ears. Uh, just stand by. Okay, we live? Yeah, that's working, brilliant. Okay, let me just get this on. One, two, one, two. Yeah, okay, that is, should be picking up my voice. It's not too loud, it says, but hopefully it's not clipping too badly. Uh, except that's only online, sorry folks, one sec. Okay, are we live? Come on, you can do it. There we go, right. Okay, brilliant. So, I switch back to the slides. Let's get cracking. Right, so obviously there is the obligatory uh, feedback slide. You know, we do like to hear feedback from you. So if you're not already on our Slack channel, then uh, please get onto it. It's completely free, costs you nothing. As usual, it's the good old slack.cpp.al, not for Lima. Uh, go ahead and register if you need help with any of the stuff we end up working on today. Uh, it's a great place to go. So I think we should just have a quick uh, recap, essentially, of, of sort of where we're at. Uh, obviously, you know, we learned about the, the sort of core paradigm that embodies uh, test-driven development. Obviously, really, there's a, there's a set of paradigms, but the main focus, of course, was, was on the central central concept. 
We, we learn about the benefits of TDD. I, I think I sort of hammered that home quite a bit, talking about how you, you will generally write a lot less, less bugs than you otherwise would, of course. Uh, obviously, I discussed the, you know, the pitfalls that you should try and avoid when you want to do TDD correctly. Don't write more code than you should. Um, avoid overly testing for confidence. You know, within reason, that kind of stuff can be fine. Uh, follow the principles of red-green refactor. Uh, the core concept, of course, of TDD, right? What it's all about, you know, which again really is this red green refactor, but the, the, it, it's the benefit that you just write so many less bugs. And of course, red, green, and refactor. And obviously, we looked at the motivation behind TDD. You know, historically, it, it hasn't been, a, it's, it's a relatively recent thing, and people are learning that it is the way to go when it comes to writing uh, robust software. So who, who uh, missed last week's? Has everyone seen it, either online or, or in person? Okay. So I'm going to get on to the core concepts of mocking, and as usual, I include a quote. Code without tests is bad code. It doesn't matter how well written it is. It doesn't matter how pretty or object-oriented or well encapsulated it is. It is just bad code. Quote there from Michael Feathers. Thank you to him. So, so first of all, what is mocking? Well, it, it, it's an implementation of an interface that is, well, you know, the, cl the clues in the word, right? Mocking a real thing, right? You're creating something that's not actually real, but it's designed to behave as, it, as the real thing would, right? For the purposes of testing some kind of interactions. And so, uh, you know, it means that all of the requirements of that interface uh, you know, are satisfied by your mock, but from within your tests, you can leverage that mock to actually control what goes, what, what it's going to pass back out and potentially fail the test if it gets something in that you don't like in your tests. And it really boils down to the fact that when we want to artificially, you know, control behavior, we use mocks, right? We, we want to have two separate systems interacting. One of them's real, one of them's not. That's our mock. We want to have a convenient way of controlling it. Mocking is the way to achieve that. So, you know, it could consist of simulating something going wrong. Um, or maybe it's, you know, some particular, particular kind of result, right? That could be an exception, I suppose, for things going wrong. Or for a particular result, maybe you're going to return uh, 42, right? The point is you control everything because it's not the real implementation. It's all, it's all well, you know, mocked up. And it allows us to segregate individual concerns, right? When I have a class that's going to interact with another class, if I've interfaced it away, then my test can just focus on one of the classes. You know, the, the, the one that's interfaced away can have a mock for it, and I can test them both in, in complete isolation. There's no interaction between them anymore, right? So obviously this does mean that you need to ensure that your mocks are going to do the right thing in terms of testing realistically um, but in terms of plumbing those two classes into each other you may test that too but that would be considered then an integration test and you still have the ability to test in isolation which is obviously a great benefit because if something goes wrong at the integration test stage you can figure out which of the two classes is to blame and then you can go off and write a new test with the mock to reproduce that failure while still having it isolated so what can we actually test with, well, you know, with, with mocking? So, first of all, you know, just bear in mind, it's, we want to ensure that we can interact with an interface as designed in our contract. That doesn't necessarily mean that the, the interface, that the real implementation of the interface is going to be perfectly correct. And so part of the benefit here is that if, if we can guarantee that one particular class is satisfying its contract, irrespective of the real implementation on honoring that or not correctly, you can essentially guarantee that that segregated piece is right and your mocks are proving that. Or possibly not, depending on whether or not you write the bug. Um, and so we can, for example, verify that a particular member function was called, right? If I have a class. So who, everyone here is familiar with classes and member functions, right, I assume. So, you know, within the interface, it will have some set of member functions. I can then, you in my test, verify that the real class that is using this interface has actually called a function. Or maybe verify that it doesn't call some particular function at all. 
right? You know, if I give it some certain amount, of, some kind of input, perhaps it's not supposed to, you know, it should never call some member function in the mock. So I could also verify that. I can use the mock to feed it some data. So, you know, generally you, you give it the mock, it, it, it interacts with it through the interface, and, you know, it might call a function, get a return value via the mock. The mock can return whatever I tell it to. So then the real implementation will receive that piece of data. And obviously I can then verify that when given that particular piece of data, the, the class under test is doing the right thing, right? Maybe it's meant to add something to that number, concatenate, you know, it depends what it is, right? But it enables you to control the, in, the internal input to that class and make sure that it behaves correctly when you observe it externally. We can also use it to expect some kind of data, right? If, if your mock is taking arguments, so in the interface there's a function that takes arguments, your mock will, is expecting to get called, and the mock can then verify that the data it's given is whatever the specific values you were expecting it to be given. So you can also verify what's going into that interface. And we can, of course, use it to you know, throw exceptions, right? So we want to see what happens when our mock throws an exception. Does the class under test blow up? Does it handle it gracefully, right? Obviously, if you're writing the class, you should probably know the answer to that. But if, if you were testing something that was, say, black box, this is, can be a useful way of actually, you know, examining what that code does. So the next question is, how do we get into, you know, well, essentially, you know, leveraging, leveraging mocks, right? So, unlike many languages, there's actually two different ways uh, in C++ that you can do this. So the first one is the most common, and that is interfaces, right? So is everyone familiar with the general idea of an interface in C++ here? You have, yeah, virtual member functions, right? So obviously, if your, your base class has these virtual member functions, you can create a mock class just by having it inherit from the interface. And then you can, you know, you can just write all of your, your made up member functions. Obviously, you don't really want to be writing a new class every time you need custom behavior. And there are frameworks that sort all this stuff out for you. And we're going to get into those later on in this session. And then you have templates. So this is probably fairly obvious, but I could just have a regular concrete class. And that concrete class has a member function called foo. And then the function I'm testing, you know, the, the implementation code that I'm writing is just templated. And the template type can be any class that has a member function called foo. So then the mock doesn't inherit from anything. It just happens to have a function, a member function called foo. So you can use templates. We're not, we're not going to focus on templates uh, just because it's, it's a somewhat messy way of, of doing it and it's not really necessary these days. Um, but it's something to be aware of, you know, you, you optionally can do it. There's nobody stopping you. And certainly the, the testing frameworks we'll get into uh, don't stand in your way if you really want to, to take this approach. Uh, but yes, we, we, we're really going to look at interfaces. That's what we care about. It's the, the, the most idiomatic, easiest to understand, arguably, and it, it follows the principles of OOP. Now, since we are focusing on interfaces, we obviously want to now look at those, those virtual member functions, right? So there's actually different ways of, of mocking with virtual member functions. So there's the purest approach, which is that you have a true interface class, right, which has nothing but pure virtual member functions. And that is it. There is, there is no implementation functions in your interface class, right? You adhere to the, the pure concept of an interface. Or your base class is actually a real implementation, and your mock class simply inherits from it and all of the functions in the, the real actual base that does stuff just has them all declared as virtual so that the mock class can just override them at will. It's not a terrible approach. I suppose it could even be useful in some cases if maybe there were certain functions you absolutely did not want to mock and you'd rather test with the real implementation. But there was a select few or some that you'd rather mock or needed to mock, you know, kind of mixing and matching. Then you know, taking this approach wouldn't stop you. Equally, though, you, you could, you know, combine the two. You could have a mixture of pure virtual and virtual. You, you could even take it a step further. You could have the, the pure interface, but you could also mix and match it so that the impl real life implementation that derived from it 
was actually what you ended up inheriting your mock from. I don't think I really recommend doing any of this. It's just, it, it's a bit messy, right? The, the, the main sort of benefit of mocking is that you've separated concerns. And, and by doing this kind of mixing and matching, you're, you're making it arguably unnecessarily complex, uh, certainly harder for anyone to, to follow and understand whether, oh, is this actually going to the mock or is this actually going to the real implementation? They'd have to look, right? It becomes very unclear. So I, my recommendation, stick to this true interface approach. The mock class inherits just from the pure interface. It doesn't have anything to do with any, any real implementations. They are all kept away and separate from each other. So, and I suppose another key question is when is it actually appropriate to use mocks, right? We could technically, as we're designing our classes, build an interface for every single one. So absolutely every single class has an interface that could be mocked, but that doesn't necessarily make sense. It just depends on your design. So, you know, unlike general testing, because because testing is, is great and, and we should test as much as possible, right? Test everything. Um, you know, mocking really does boil down to whether or not it's going to make sense within the design and context of what you're building. So as a result, generally speaking, you're going to be mocking out of necessity, right? It's going to be driven by the fact that you're saying, oh, I need this particular implementation to go away and for the thing that's going to use it to actually, in order for me to test it, have to use a mock, right? You're thinking about testability. That is what will guide your usage of mocks, really, will drive your usage of mocks because you want to abstract away these, these concrete implementations. However, sorry, question. Uh, turn it on. There's a switch on the front. Is, is that, would you, would you use that <coughs> then when, when you're, you're getting potentially unknown inputs to a function? Yes, precisely. So if, if, if you don't know what inputs you might get, uh, you know, potentially you're dealing with, it could be a third party class even, right? You're, you're, it's a bit of a black box. You could essentially leverage, you know, create a little wrapper interface with a wrap with with a wrapper implementation, and start driving it with tests of what you do know, so that you could capture that knowledge. So yes, that's, that's, that's perfectly also a perfectly viable reason to use mocks. Um, but yes, so but there is a corollary where you know sometimes a single use concrete implementation being used directly by what you're testing might possibly make sense. Um, the emphasis really here is on single use, right? If I'm going to build a small class, right? that I could interface away, right? My, my, the, thing I'm the class I'm testing, the code I'm testing, is going to want to use this, this other class. But, well, it, it's going to be very small. Nobody else will be using it at all, right? There'll be zero purpose. It won't serve, you know, it won't serve anything else in the code base. It might be acceptable to say, okay, I won't interface this particular little, this particular small class away for mocking just because it's good enough to plug the implementation directly in because when I test it, I'll expect that to do exactly the same thing anyway. Then it might make sense. But, you know, as I've been harping on, mocking, along with taking the TDD approach, you know, red, green, new factor, will drive your design. You will, you will start thinking, oh, you know, I can't just plumb this in directly because my tests would need to test both classes, right? When you're designing, when you're writing unit tests, those unit tests should be testing a single class. If it starts to bleed over and you find that you're actually verifying or interacting with code in more than one class, you probably do want to, to start using a mock instead. Obviously, there is that exception of, of these sort of small, single-use, one, one-shot, you know, implementation classes that plump that you're going to plug in, but they tend to be rare, to be honest. So now let's have a little chat about mocking frameworks because there's quite a few of them. Um, obviously, you know, much like in within test-driven development. We want a framework, it's going to make our life a lot easier. You know, you don't want to have to write a brand new class as a sort of handcrafted mock every single time that you, you, you need to actually expect some data, return a particular value, right? That's just, that's just messy. So for mocking, there's a, there's, a, there's a few options. I mean, there's actually several options, um, but I'm just going to go through some of the sort of mo most popular ones. So first of all, we have Google Mock. Uh, Google Mock essentially is a freebie that, that just comes bundled with, with Google Test and consequently, you know, it's best chosen if you're already using Google Test, right? Um, you do have to compile it, 
So, but, but the same applies to Google Test. And if you can get Google Test to compile, it will compile Google Mock for you as well anyway. There is Hippo Mocks. Uh, this was actually written by one of our guest, spe uh, guest speakers, Peter Bindles. Uh, one unfortunate downside, though, is that it actually relies on undef undefined behavior. Um, if you look inside the header, it does sort of overly clever things like code injection, and as a result, does not play well with sanitizers at all. Um, and I would certainly say that it will not fare well in terms of standing the test of time. I'll guarantee that newer compilers will ultimately break it and they'll be playing a game of sort of cat and mouse to try and keep hippo mocks working rather than broken. And then we have Trompeloy. So this is a relatively sort of recent player on the scene and it's C++ 11 slash 14. Well, I believe that if you, if you use 11, there's some limitations. So I think I believe 14 is preferred, uh, but don't quote me on that. It is header only. So of course that makes it super duper simple to, to, to utilize. And even better, it integrates with Catch2. It integrates with more than just Catch2, but obviously since we are already working with Catch2, that's the, you know, the, the, the thing that we, we sort of care about most. So consequently, guess what? We are we're gonna be looking at Trompeloy. And since of course it's you know, clean C++14, it will work on a Mac, it will work on Windows, it will work on Linux, etc. Can you ever mix and match your mocking frameworks? Can you ever mix and match your mocking frameworks? So, uh, sometimes. I am quite sure you could mix and match uh, Trompeloy and Google Mock. I don't think they have any overlapping macros. Although if they do, then you need to separate the translation units. You couldn't use both in one translation unit. Um, ones like... Hippo mocks I would have less confidence in, but that's really because it's just doing magical, undefined behavior, injecting assembler code and overly crazy stuff that, that's just not going to stand the test of time. So let, let's start talking about Trompeloy, right? Let's get into the guts of, of the framework. And again, a great quote, if you're not doing test-driven development, you're doing debug later development by James Grenning. It's very true, right? You'll, you'll just discover tons of bugs that you didn't know were there, and you have to fix them later in the debugger. So, first a little bit about Trompeloy, really, really the technical parts though. So, obviously as I've already mentioned, it, it integrates with a variety of unit testing frameworks and it provides you with a, a first class quality mocking experience, right? It's got all of the, all of the tools that you want in your shed. Uh, we're obviously going to be using Trompeloy with Catch2 because, you know, in fact we started with Catch2 last week and you, we should find this a very, very flawless experience in terms of, of extending on to mocking. And as already mentioned, it is header only, so it's super easy to integrate. You just, the, the, the only caveat you have to really be aware of is that you must uh, include catch to itself before you include Trompeloy's header. So catch needs to be included first, then Trompeloy after. Uh, it does only support modern C++, so if you, if you want to do some legacy stuff, you know, C++03 or 98 or older, it's not going to work. Uh, a recent compiler is very much recommended. There is, there is a good table of compatibility in terms of compilers. Um, there's some fairly serious caveats if you're using old versions of GCC, so uh, I recommend you just, just stay away from those and use a, a, re a recent and modern compiler. And it really does offer a wealth of features for testing with, with the, the, you know, the mocking facilities it offers. Um, there's, there's absolutely tons. We're going to get into some of the, the core ones, um, but it is extremely flexible. So, first of all, we're just going to revisit you know, the code for, well, for interfaces. So I have a class. I'm going to call it interface. Obviously, that's arbitrary. C++ does not treat the word interface as special in any way. It's not special. It's just a word to C++, so I've, I've used it. So we're going to obviously start our, you know, public uh, section, you know, all the publicly visible parts of the class. So we're going to first of all have a function called do stuff. It does not take any arguments and it returns a boolean. And obviously we have the virtual keyword so that it can be overridden. And who would like to tell me what the equals zero does? 
equals zero indeed makes it a pure virtual function, so you cannot instantiate this class as a result directly. And then we'll have another pure virtual function. So, you know, again, got the virtual keyword to say that it's overridable. It returns a std string. It's called do other stuff. And it takes an integer, which I've, I've put x in there. That's obviously a suggestion. If you inherit from this class, nobody's forcing you to call it x. But it's suggested. And then we have a virtual destructor. Obviously, you can note that the, the destructor is, is not uh, pure virtual. It's merely virtual. Would anyone like to tell me why it's quite important to have a virtual destruct, a defaulted virtual destructor? So you can unroll properly uh, any created objects. So that was so you can unroll. Unroll. So basically, when you uh, create them, so they will be then unrolled in the right order. So, yeah. So once they're, um, they're, they're constructed, then they will be destructed in the, in the right order. Has anyone got a refinement on that? So that the, the correct uh, destructor is called the one from the. <coughs> so you just match the correct destructor? Yes. I'll take that one. So by ensuring that the destructor is virtual, when, when someone inherits from it, if the instance is destructed as if it were the base, so in this particular case, if I have some implementation that's derived from this, but when I, when I call its destructor, when I delete it or whatever, I have it cast it to interface. Because it's virtual, the language will ensure that we dispatch to the implementation's destructor in the same way that calling do stuff would ensure that you dispatch to that implementation's function. So it prevents bad behavior. It prevents memory leaks, because if you never call the destructor of the derived class, you'll just leak its memory, right? It prevents disaster. Sorry, so the default there, is it because it's better for the compiler to synthesize this for us, since we're not, since it's just an interface class? So, the, 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 the equals default is uh, obviously a C++11 feature. Uh, we, we're just telling the compiler that it's explicitly defaulted, right? The, we, we could just put empty curly braces there if we wanted, but there's no need. We, equals default obviously is, is more explicit. So, so now let's look at an implementation. So I've decided to call it implement. So we, have, we now have a derived class, which we're calling implement, and it's publicly inheriting from interface, right? So actually, here's a, here's a good question. Can any, does anyone want to try and have a go at telling me what would happen if I declared this protected or private in the, in the uh, inheritance declaration? If it's protected, then you have only access to uh, functions that are uh, yeah, uh, if it's private, then definitely you have a private. Uh, public is only public, so protect I can't remember actually. Michael's got it's protected. Then you can have access to the the implement have access to yeah can have access to the members of the interface but if it's private it's not gonna have access to the it's not gonna have access to like do other stuff do stuff and all that ah uh, no not quite so my, my, I think Michael won't have a go I'd imagine you would have problems overriding the interface functions um, if you derive private or protected. You know, well. Yes. No, no. Uh, <coughs> private. Protected, probably not. It's from, so from the from YouTube. Uh, you cannot access it using an object from outside. From the outside. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, if it was if it was protected inheritance, then 
it wouldn't be particularly useful because it means that only derive only only classes that derive from implement will actually be able to see that there's this inheritance going on and they'll be the only ones that can call do stuff or do other stuff or you know interface uh, well you don't want to call it a structure really but but these two functions essentially and if it was private uh, then it's kind of rendered completely useless because nobody can actually see it at all. Um, I suppose you could try and you could you could try and do something very clever. Is you, you could have a you could get well. I think you could get away with having a static uh, member. You could have a static function or some kind of function inside this class that would return a reference or a pointer to to interface, and the class itself would would take care of doing the cast, and then protect or private could actually work because inside that class it can perfectly legally cast its own stuff down to the base. It's just anyone outside of it who can't actually do that. Anyway, we haven't done any of that, any of that crazy stuff. We, we've just got a simple class called implement and it's inheriting from, from interface, right? So obviously we get our public section. We call, well, sorry, but we define uh, do stuff. We have, of course, the override keyword that was introduced in C++11. Who would like to tell me what override actually does anyone anyone yes. uh, so we know that uh, this function is overridden but correct and uh, skip it it's just for the developer yes correct so override is simply a safety check you, if you forget to do it <coughs> modern compilers will tell you that you should think about adding it but they won't they won't fail your compilation they'll just tell you you probably want that and it just returns true right nothing particularly interesting and then, of course, we have our implementation of do other stuff. And instead of override, we've used final. Who would like to tell me what final is doing? It put an end to any further uh, modification of the do other stuff method uh, down the, the line, the hierarchy. So it prevents further overriding, we could say, right? Yeah. Yeah. What else does it do? You can You can derive from implement, but you won't be able to override do other stuff anymore. But there's something else that final does. This is, this is an almost a trick question, but not really. Is uh, it's not overridden in child classes? from YouTube. Uh, is that from now? Yeah. Mm. So, I, I thought, okay, that's from now. I can kind of decipher that. Yes, final also does what override will get you, right? If you have override and it turns out that, you know, if I made a typo in do stuff, and I had one, I missed an F, for example, then obviously it wouldn't match the virtual which means it would fail to compile because it will say, well, you've declared override here, but it's not actually overriding anything. And the same rule applies to final. If you put final in there, not only does it prevent further inherit, uh, you know, further overriding, it will also give you that safety check as well. It will actually fail to compile. It's not overriding. Uh, microphone. Override too. So final means that it's overriding. Do stuff so so f override interface. merely does a safety check. Final prevents further inheritance and also does the same safety check. And, and it's also an override. Of as, as, and it's an override of interface. So final. So do so other stuff. You, you will always be. You will always be an override. You will always be an override of this. If I didn't put. If I didn't put override. So if override was missing. This would still act as an override. This is just a safety check keyword. It's saying to the compiler, please verify that this is overriding. It doesn't actually affect the behavior. Override, the override keyword is a safety check. So I mean, do other stuff on this one is of overriding in interface, right? It's overriding, it's overriding other this. stuff, yeah? Yeah. And the final keyword prevents anyone else from, from doing it and also includes the safety check as well. And, you know, we'll just do a simple ternary operator. If x is 4, return hello. If it's anything else, return by. OK. So does that seem clear enough to everyone? We've got an interface and a concrete implementation there, right? Nothing to do with mocking yet.
but that is your, in, your, your basic interface and implementation design, yeah? Okay. So let's take that interface. We've got the exact same interface that we had on the previous slide. And now we're going to introduce a mock. And this is, of course, going to be how you mock with Trompeloy, right? Specifically Trompeloy. This is not how you would do it in Google Mock. Those are different, OK? So this is just Trompeloy. So I'm going to call my class mock. I can call it whatever I want. I've decided to give it that name. You, it's up to you what you want to call it. Obviously, we want public inheritance from interface. And again, you have your, your public section. And you have this macro in Trompeloy called make, mock, and then a number. And the number, so in this case, zero, is dependent on the number of arguments that the function you're going to mock is taking. And then you define a series of arguments that you give to this macro. So the first argument is the name of the function. So obviously the name is, well, do stuff, right? The second argument is its return type, brackets, and if it does take any arguments, you put the arguments in the brackets. So in this particular case, it doesn't take any arguments, so they're just empty brackets. So if you can see, we've got the name, do stuff, which maps to the name. We've got the bool, which maps to the return type, and the empty parentheses, which obviously maps to the empty arguments. And then finally, because it is... Oh, we have a question. So yes. why don't we have after bool uh, a comma? Because now it looks like it's uh, it's a method bool. Sorry, the question was what? So the first one is do stuff. Yeah, so that's the name of our, our, no, our we're method. making one mock. Yeah, but then you have open the, the, the first brackets, yes? You have do stuff, which is the name of Correct. the function which you are uh, testing. That's the name of the Bool name. is the return. Return type and any arguments. Yeah, so the, the arguments are connected with the return. Shouldn't be the, a comma between bool and uh, the brackets? No. They're not separate. So here, it's a bit weird, but here, bool is a, what you see is a function type. So it's saying this is a function that returns bool and takes no arguments. Uh, bear with me, folks, one sec. So My Mac apparently is not charging. And that would be really, really bad for the slide, the show. It's a peculiar, like, syntax. OK, thing. all is fixed. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's just the, this is how the Trompeloy macro works, right? It expects the return type and any arguments as one for the second argument. Uh, and then, of course, we have override because we want it to fail to compile if, for some reason, I typoed on do stuff. If I miss out override, it will just happily define a mock function, which obviously isn't really that useful if it's not actually matching something in the interface. But you can do that if you wish. Probably more useful for templates, right? So, so when I was mentioning actually earlier, if we just go back for a sec, if you miss out override, and I gave this a completely different name, we've created a mock function, but it's got nothing to do with the interface, which you could use from a, you know, some code you're testing that takes a template type, right? So then we have make mock one, unsurprisingly, because do other stuff takes one argument, right? It takes an int. And again, the first argument is the name of the function. The second argument is the return type, and then the argument type in brackets. Obviously, you don't want to give, you know, you don't need to provide the, the, the variable name. You just give the type, so I just put int. And of course, we have override as well. And great. You had more than one argument. With that so, thing. so if, if if you have more than one argument, you'd have to do a few things. So, this number would have to be incremented. So, if this take took three arguments, I'd have to do make mock three, and I'd have to put you know then int comma float comma whatever um, uh, method that have the same number of arguments. So let, let's say we have another one which is take zero arguments. Wouldn't be in a clash of the make mock zero. No, you can use make mock zero, make mock one, make mock two, whatever, as many times as you like for as many unique functions as you like. Uh, question from Michael. What if you have um, generic functions? 
where you would have to specify a type. What do you mean by generic functions? Uh, template functions. Oh, you want to make a mocker on, on, a, on a template type? For example. Uh, to my knowledge, the answer is, is that it's unsupported. Uh, if I've not tried it on a template class, a class template, if the class itself is a template, you may be able to substitute the type name into make mock zero, but I haven't, or into make mock whatever. I haven't tried it though. Um, that's a good question. We should, we should. That will be a that be a good subject for next week. Is temp mo mocks on, on template template member functions. I mean, there's one caveat to this, which which kind of makes it slightly useless, is that you cannot template virtual functions anyway. Correct. Yeah. But you can template the class though, so there is still some relevance there. All right. So that's the mock. And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to sort of move the right hand side over to the left hand side and combine them into one. So we now have our interface and you have the, the mock there. Right, I'm just keeping them over here. And now time for a big, big old box of code. So I'm going to write a function, right? This is the function I want to test, right? This is, this is what I'm going, I'm going to unit to test this function. So this function returns a std string and it takes a reference to the interface, right? So obviously that means I can now feed it an implementation. I can feed it a real one, a fake one, whatever, right? It's my choice. So first of all, it calls, it's going to call do stuff on the interface it receives, which obviously returns a Boolean. And it just puts it in a variable called OK. And then we're going to call do other stuff with uh, 123. And obviously that's meant to return a std string. So ret is going to be a std string. And then if OK is true, we will append OK to the string that we got back. And then we'll just return it, right? So either we'll return it. Can I ask a question, Oli? Uh, question, yes. To the make mock, what if the, the return type is specified as auto? Um, well, it can't be. You have to have a concrete type. OK. Um, so. Yes, either we end up returning just the string that do other stuff gave us, or we end up returning that with OK chunked onto the end. And that's the end of the function, you know, this, this little function that we're going to TD, pretend that we already TDD'd it, I've written the test first. And in fact, here comes the test case. So the test case is just verifying our code uses the interface correctly, right? So first of all, we have to create an instance of mock. So we have mock here an instance, right? Simple enough. Now we're using more of the Trompoloi mocking features, the magic, right? We're going to require that our function we're testing actually calls do stuff, right? So we require it. If, if it doesn't, if, if, if this is not called, we will fail the test. The test will not pass, right? As I said, Trompoloi integrates into catch and it, will, and it will inform catch that the test, the test is considered to be failed, and you'll get a nice error from catch telling you that it failed because it's supposed to have called that mock function and it failed to do so. So that's our first part, right? We're going to require that call. Is that, is that clear to everyone? So, so the, yeah. the, the test case and the require call is catch2. The mock and the do stuff is trompoloi. No, the test case is catch2. Right. The mock, I mean, the mock is technically just technically just a class, right? But it's got some special generated stuff in it. Uh, the require call is trompoloi as well. Okay. Yeah, require call is trompoloi. It integrates into catch2, but it's trompoloi that's integrating. And then we're going to add some extra restrictions and requirements. So the mock is going to return true. So in when, when we do all this stuff, obviously I haven't, I haven't used this yet. I'm just set, this is the setup phase, right? We're setting stuff up, setting the stage. So, in front of the return, there is a dot in front of the return. I've just moved. I've moved it onto another line for readability. It could just be up here. Okay, I just I just moved it down a line for readability. So, when the mock, we require that the mock is called, or we fail the test, and then when it is called, assuming it is called, we return true back to this function. So it's going to get true in here. Then we're going to require that this function also calls do other stuff. So again. 
If it fails to do that, we're going to fail it. Now, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. You might notice we have this underscore where the arguments are. And this is also a trompe feature. So essentially, I could have put a concrete value in here. I could have put one, two, three, which then means that this require call would have only matched when the implementation passed one, two, three. And I don't, I don't really want to do that in this case, right? Because I'd get a weird error. If I, if I put one, two, three, and then this didn't actually do that, I would, just, I would get a, a test failed because it was never called. And I'd be looking at my code and thinking, well, it does call it. But as far as Tron is concerned, it didn't because the matcher didn't actually match, which is not good. So consequently, what I'm saying here is that I'm going to have it just accept any call. doesn't matter what the argument is. It will match this, this requirement. But then because I, do want, I still do want to make sure it passes the correct number, right? I still want to validate that. I can say that the first argument, argument one, should be equal to one, two, three. So it'll still match, so it'll be less confusing if it passes the wrong number, but it will still make sure that it does actually give me the correct value that I want. And then that will just return yes. So ret, obviously, is going to get the string yes in it. And then this is obviously now just using catch, right? This final line is just catch. We call the function func to test, which is this. And we pass it the mock class that we've just set up. And of course, we make sure that given the do stuff will return true, and given that do other stuff will be given one, two, three, and we'll return yes. Obviously, that should be yes plus OK, with a little space there. So it should be yes, OK. Does that make sense to everyone? It makes sense, but why don't you just use catch to do the whole lot? How? How could you make catch do that? Just if it returns yes, OK, with the call do other stuff. You but do other stuff isn't doing that. You just, can you not do a check? Do other stuff. One, two, three. Keep but I'm not. Yes, OK. Yes. But I'm not testing. I'm not testing <coughs> any. I'm, I'm testing this function, right? So, so how do you propose that I verify that this function is using this correctly and this correctly? Yes. I'm not testing any of this. This is not under test. This is this is the this is the setup right. okay. for this is a mock, right? I don't you don't test your mock. Your mock is part of your framework for doing testing. Yeah? Yeah? Okay, cool. All right, so now let's have a quick look at some, sorry, before I actually before I brush on, is everyone else happy and clear and all good? Brilliant, okay. And nothing online, no one's? Exactly the same question. Brilliant, okay. Yeah, you don't, you don't test your mocks, right? I'll just switch back. I'm not testing the mock, that would be silly. I'm, I'm testing this function called func to test, right? And I want to verify that it's correctly calling stuff in the interface, that it's correctly passing the appropriate values. And that requires mocking, and it requires a mock framework. So let's have a look at some, some, some core mock behaviors. So obviously, you saw there is require call, right? So you know, we're basically saying that some particular function that's being mocked in the interface must be called. If it's not called, we're going to fail the test. And it's worth bearing in mind that there's actually an interesting distinction, and I hope I remember this right, because I'm pretty sure I've run into it before. In the land of Google Test and Google Mock, you will fail a mock expectation when the test reaches its, its end, right? When you, when you get to the, when, once you exit the, the test unit, it will then fail if any of your mocks didn't match. Whereas in trompe it's different. It will fail when the mock class object goes out of scope. Obviously, it's up to you. You can extend the life of it however you wish. Um, but that is, I'm pretty sure that's the case. It's a, a key difference. Uh, there is also, however, allow call and forbid call, right? So depending on how, what your test is, is, is doing and what you need to design for, you can simply allow a function to be called, but it doesn't 
have to be called, right? This is, you, in, in the case of allow call, this is usually when you're writing sort of generic mock setups, and maybe I'm gonna have like 200 tests, and some of them will call it, some of them will not, and I don't really care, it's not something I actually need to verify, then I would probably use allow call, because it means that if it doesn't, if a particular setup, a particular scenario, test case, whatever, doesn't actually call it, I don't care, happy days. And then of course there's the corollary of require call, which is forbid call, if it does get called, you fail, right? You fail that test unit. And then of course we had with, right? So this is validating that a particular argument that was passed to the function is correct, right? We're expecting something to be in a certain way with, you know, with something equaling something, with something being greater than something, less than something, whatever, whatever particular evaluation you want to do that is gonna eventually evaluate to you know, true or false effectively. And then of course there's return, right? We are returning some value from the mock, right? Under our control, we're saying, yeah, give it back 42, give it back whatever it is. And let's just have a quick quick chat about some extended features, for those of you who want to get a little bit fancy maybe in the future. Uh, there's several additional behaviors. There's throw. So obviously the, you, rather than putting return, you put throw and give it some kind of exception that you want to throw instead. So the function won't actually return anything, it will throw an exception, and the thing you're testing now has to handle that in some way, or puke it back up to you, whatever you want. And of course, you know, as I've said, it's just gonna give you a throw an exception of your choice. In sequence, this is quite a nice one if, you're, if you need to get very strict, this will actually verify, right, that all of the functions are called in a specific order. So if I, if I do quickly pop back, Oh, it's going to be a bit of a slog, isn't it, to go back, but come on, we can do it. There we go. So if we have this, the series of, if we had it in sequence here on the first require call, and then in sequence again on the second require call, and you, you have to create an, a sequence object, right, it's just a class to instantiate. What you can essentially do is it will, it will cause Trompoloy to verify that this was called before this, and it will fail your test again if the function calls happen out of sequence. So let's just rush forwards. And yeah. So that's nice if you need to ensure that it's in a particular order. Um, then you can also verify that your function is called at least X number of times, or at most Y number of times, or exactly Z times, right? Whichever of the three you want. You know, maybe I say that when I give it some value, it's gonna call a function in a loop. So if I give it the value five, then it should be called exactly five times. So you can also verify that through your mocks. There is also a side effect feature. Uh, in Google Test, you could essentially achieve this with like a, a, an invoke and lambda statement. But essentially you have a, a side effect little joiner you can append onto your, your require call or allow call. And essentially it lets you cause a side effect. So in the, in the brackets of that, you can you know, change a global variable, some kind of, well, the name says it all right, a side effect. So, let's talk about a TDD project with mocks, and I thought I'd just go with something mildly amusing there. To err is human, to debug is divine, but no idea who came up with that one. So, First of all, since we discovered last week that GitHub's classroom is incredibly slow, I'm actually gonna give you the URL ahead of time before we dive into some of the design stuff. So please grab the URL now, and I'll go through some more of the code before we actually start the whole session. So uh, it's gonna be posted to Slack and YouTube, uh, but we're gonna go over, so there's gonna be more slides, just go and get yourself set up and we'll carry on. Uh, yeah, it's quite slow. There's the URL. It will be pasted onto Slack and YouTube momentarily, and then I will move on to talking about what we're going to be doing. Who is not on Slack or on the YouTube? Okay, uh, you can go to youtube.com slash cpplondonuni if you want to grab the link from there. Tom, you've got the link here? Yeah? So you can go to youtube.com slash cpplondonuni 
and open the live video, you'll see the chat on the right, or you can go to Slack, one of the two. Yeah. So, please get yourself set up on Classroom while I go through this, or I'll, 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 give, you guys, I'll give you guys a moment just to click the client, the fork button, just. Okay, Tom is failing to copy and paste. Uh, did you get logged out of Slack? No, you need to. Okay. All right, so we're going to build a little sort of rental system, like a, well, let's call it Blockbuster, yeah? A little video rental system. We're going to make millions, right? That was such a success. Uh, yeah, it's going to be, but it's going to be generic, actually. So, so I say video rental, but, but the sky is the limit for us. We're, we're, we're thinking big. Um, you know, we'll, we'll start out with handling videos, but we're going to aim for something that's reasonably, actually reasonably, uh, you know, generic. And obviously the purpose of making it this generic, which is obviously, you know, extremely a bit over the top, a bit over engineered. But the point is it's an exercise, right? We're, we're here to, to learn. And we want to leverage mocking. So the best way to do that is over engineer the hell out of everything and we'll get there. So consequently, it's going to consist of several parts. You're, of course, free to design stuff your own way. Um, if you're unsure, then you know, come and see guidance from me or Tristan. Uh, or if you're online, ask questions, you know, or get on our Slack. Um, but you know, the, the whole point here is to learn. So you can, you can go as, as far as you like in terms of interfacing. Ignore, ignore what I said earlier about small concrete classes. Just go for it. So first of all, we're going to have the concept of uh, rent I rentable. So so interfaces are going to be prefixed with I. So so I rentable means it satisfies the the, the concept of something that you can rent out, right? And obviously, you know, there's some functionality to to expose in something that's rentable. So we're going to have a name. So you know that could, in the case of a video, be the the name of the the film on the video. You know. Titanic or whatever it is. The type, so obviously that would be that it's a video, right? Because technically the rentable thing could might not be a video. It could be an audio cassette. You know, it could be could be a car. It could be anything. And then it's going to to store its rental start and end times. So obviously this is this is something that will be dynamically updated every time it's given to somebody. So every time the rentable object is rented out to a person, its its start and end rental times will be updated. So the start will be whenever that renter, the, the customer, whenever the customer took it. And the end date will be however long they were given it for. It could be a week, two weeks, whatever the, the period is. And obviously then there's a cost per day associated with that. And then there's a penalty per day associated with that, right? So if they don't return it in time, then, then they, they have to pay a penalty. So we need to store that on the object. So the, 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 the first two, you know, the name and the type, they're effect, they will never change, essentially, on an instance. And the cost per day and penalty per day also will effectively never change, we're going to say. But the rental start and end times will. And then we're going to have uh, iCustomer, so an interface that satisfies the, the concept of a customer. Uh, you know, it could be a person, it could be a business. Obviously, we'll focus on people at first. It's relatively simple. But the interface will be generic enough that it can be either. So. It's going to be old school. We're going to have a name. So if it's a person, it will be their full name. If it's a business, it will be the business name. Uh, have their address, you know, wherever they're located, registered address. A monetary balance, right, which could be positive or negative, but we'll have that wrapped up in a, in a class of its own, so that's fine. And, of course, you know, some way of uh, accessing the, you know, a list of, of active rentals, you know, things that this customer has rented out. Uh, plus some functions that let you assign a rental to them or take one away from them once they've, you know, returned it. Uh, sorry, is that all? That's all clear so far. Yeah. And then we're going to have an inventory manager, right? And this is there's no code for this 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 particular class in the in the code you're going to clone. This is this is going to be from scratch. So the inventory manager will have ownership of these i rentable you know objects right until they are essentially handed out for rental. And now I'm going to use some 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 conditional keywords here. It might need to take care of setting the rental times when it's handed out. Might, 
might not, right? Just depends. You could design it a completely different way. So I'm not saying you have to do this, you, you can choose to. And when a rental is handed back, you might want the inventory manager to be the one that will update balances. How much did they spend, right? Are there any penalties to apply? But equally, you might want to abstract that out into yeah, another class, right? You could have a, a finance manager or something like that. So I am now going to get cracking. We are going to transition the live stream over to, uh, well, hopefully over to Sea Lion. So please bear with me while I do a little bit of logistics with the power cable. And fingers crossed that this will be utterly seamless and nobody will hopefully notice a thing. So if this behaves itself, I should be able to display the capture window, reorder it. And apparently OBS now needs accessibility control. All right, one second. Okay, so if somebody online could confirm for me that they see Sea Lion. I think that's locked. Uh, right, now that I've sorted, well, I've sorted out OBS, so now I'm going to take the plunge and we're going to hopefully get it on the big screen. Don't let me down. Oh, we got that. Uh, could someone please go to YouTube for me and just verify that it hasn't completely ruined the resolution on the video? Before we get cracking. And I'll switch to presentation mode. What's it looking like? That's a good screen on that one. Sorry? Okay, that's, oh, it's, yeah, it's come together. Okay. Oh, cool. All right, so, uh, who has got it all cloned? Tristan's looking concerned. No, all good, okay. Right, so first of all, I'm going to need a view on, where is it, the project. All right, so you can see I've got Markdown over here. Uh, we have a basic folder. We've only got a test main, as you can see. So just to go over what we've got, we've got our interfaces defined. There is an iCustomer which is, as I described, right, you've got some const accessible member functions. So this one returns the name, the address, the balance, the rentals, one to adjust the balance, one to assign rentals, one to remove rentals. So I'm going to start with, well, creating a customer implementation, right? So we're going to need a test first. So I'm going to right click on the test folder. I will make a new C++ source file and we'll call it test. Uh, should we call it customer or human customer? Any any opinions? Business customer. Sorry. Business customer. Human customer. Business customer. Hmm? Retired customer. Retail. Retail customer. Yes, yeah, I'm saying. Okay, so we should go. Should we go? Let's go with test. Should we go? Do we want to go with human customer? We're going to go with human customer. AI, AI customer. Yeah. Um, test Borg customer, yeah? yeah. Uh, let's just do customer, you know, I'll just keep it, keep it short. Makes my life easier, I can get through this faster. So, first of all, obviously, I want to include cat, right? Okay, I'm not going to bother with Trompoloy just yet. I'll, I'll include it as and when I need it. So, uh, you know, we want our TDD, so let's start declaring a test uh, fixture. So, test case, 
um, customer class correctly uh, assigns name. Make sense? Yeah? So next thing I'm going to need, of course, is to include the interface. So interface slash my customer. So one, one thing I'm going to mention is that when I do this, I do prefer to do everything in one file. So do everything in the translation unit. And then once there's enough code to justify it, I will then break the implementation out into its own file. But initially, I'll just keep it in the tests. Uh, that's complaining. Why is that complaining? For no good reason. I've got include there. There's no real reason why that should should whine at me. Uh, that is in the test folder, isn't it? Yeah. Interface slash icon. I'm just going to try building it for a sec. Let's just see what happens. Uh, I don't want to build that. I want to build the test. Let's just do build all. Uh, no, it's not. It's in fact not finding it. So we have I customer. That is correctly spelled, isn't it? That's a bit strange. Uh, no, because it should have a relative path of include should be relative since it's added to the. Uh, oh no no no! It's, this is there's a bug. Sorry, folks. You need to put test block pasta in the. Target include directories. It's repeat, repeated. So this this highlighted line here, you need to fix on in your. If you've cloned it, it will just say blockbuster. You need to add the word test in front of it. Okay. No, just one of them. This is for blockbuster, and this is for the tests. Right. So now it should not be complaining. Oh, go away. Yeah, it's good. Right. So obviously, you know, given that we've got a uh, customer class, which we'll construct with uh, John Smith, right? We can oh, require cast dot name is equal to oh good, it's there we go, John Smith, right? So we have a failing test because it's not even going to compile. So let's take it a step further. We'll have class customer. And you know what? I'm actually going to take this even further. I'm going to make the test say cust import, and then we can have an i customer ref. In fact, no, even better than that, a const i customer ref called cust, which is from the import. Right. So now we have the public i customer. Go for the public functions. And we'll say that std string name const. Is it no except as well? I can't remember. Uh, it was just const. And it actually is wrong. It takes a const string ref. It's an override. Brilliant, look at that code. That's amazing, isn't it? Tricky. So obviously we need a constructor for it. So we're going to define the constructor. It takes a std string. And it will do nothing. So as you can see, this, this amazing piece of code uh, will, in theory, pass our tests. Um, however, I am missing some implementation, so I'm just going to copy out some boilerplate here just to get it to compile. So let me copy that. And we'll just shove this lot down here. So all the virtual functions, we're just going to get them implemented as dummies. Obviously, you don't want to call them because they'll crash. So the real one, so it's got the 
fake stuff here, really. Real stuff's all here. Okay, so we got our mutable functions there. We'll just separate them. Okay. So we're just focusing on the name right now, yeah? So we've got an empty constructor. And we've got name. Returning John Smith. That's probably a bit of a harsh way of doing this, but I'm, I'm actually going to... I'm going to take that approach. So we've now got a test case. Tars is John Smith, expects John Smith. Brilliant, right? A bit of an insidious test, but we're going to run it. So, uh, how can I change the target? Uh, all right, I have no idea how to do it in present presentation mode. So I'm just going to get the heck out of that and fix it myself. Uh, thank you. Back to presentation mode. Okay, good, and let's run the test. Some of the fastest compilation in the West over here. By which I mean not at all. So, Well, we've already got our first massive failure. This is why TDD is great. Does anyone, anyone, anyone want to tell me why that's failed? Why you got this, this, this garbage here? Hint, it's something to do with the return type. Nobody? It's a temporary. It's constructing a temporary and returning it, which is already dead by the time you return. So, our code is already rubbish. So, what we can, however, do is we can have a std string on the class, right? Love that. And you know what? That's our first test, our first bug fixed. Right. Any bets on what will happen now? Should pass, right? No, I don't want to do that, though. That's inefficient. And also, no, because I have to change the interface, and I don't want to change the interface. And it passes. Brilliant. We've got some, essentially, rubbish code. So what if I copy this test case? And let's just expand that. Yes, question. Uh, I, I had the case before when I was trying a bit with uh, returning, um, how shall I say, uh, variables that you created within the within the class. Shouldn't the const return type actually keep the variable alive for long long enough that it gets copied? No, into const does not extend lifetime. But I mean, I, I I remember that under certain circumstances it just it copies anyway, although you um, return it by reference. Like. Never mind. So, 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 also, yes, Tristan was mentioning it's a const can extend lifetime in specific cases, but not in this case. I think I know what you're referring to there, Michael. If you have like a local variable type, then that can keep a temporary alive. But uh, that doesn't apply in this case. It's only if you have a local variable, like inside a function, whose type is a const reference. Uh, well, you wouldn't want to allocate. You could um, you could return by non-reference, in which case you'd you'd have a copy, or you could make sure that the string stays alive for long enough, which is what Ollie's done here. You could you could you could make yes, you could heap allocate and and and, and pass it back. If you're just leaking memory, then that's awful. Um, but yeah, just just to just to point out what I'm saying, you could do like that is absolute garbage, by the way. Complete trash. Don't do it. Uh, right. So we're back to this. So we've got John Smith, the science name. Uh, I don't know. Someone, someone pick a favorite superhero, someone fictional who's fun. Judge Dredd. There we go. Judge Dredd. Right. John Judge Dredd. <laughs> 
All right, that's taking an interesting turn. OK, so we now have a sec separate test. And it should fail, right? Fail, because it didn't match. Cool. So now, of course, this forces us to generalize. So we can go back up here. Clearly, the solution's pretty simple, isn't it? I can just do name, std move name for the optimizations, eh? And we've done it, right? I can get rid of this now, because that's unnecessary. And it should now pass both tests, right? We shouldn't have, shouldn't have broken the existing one. It should all just be good. So, yeah, we've done it. Cool. All right, so let's, let's, let's see if we can get into a bit of mocking here. So, uh, I, I, I argue that I should address the address, uh, address, address, uh, or balance, but I'm actually going to skip ahead. Well, it's not really skipping, but I'm going to move on and, and deal with this I rentable thing because this is going to require me to, to do some mocking actually to sort this one out. Um, or even a sign, actually, a, maybe a sign rental and, and, and rentals is probably related. So let's, yeah, let's, let's move those together because it makes more sense, right? So we'll, we'll cut this out. We'll, we'll put them together just because it's nice. And so logically, right, if I give it uh, an instance of an iRentable, it should then show up. It should show up in the, the list of, of, of these things. So let, let, let's make a test case, yeah? So test case, uh, customer class, correctly stores some rentable, uh, oh wait, not that, uh, yeah, rentable items. Uh, but we're still not quite into the mocking phase because it's not, gonna, it's not really going to call anything on it, is it? Uh, what, can I, what can I do that's going to require mocking? Uh, I could probably get away with having the remove rental being on it as well. So just to mention, I did make the, the code for rentals a little bit challenging for you because you obviously have a vector, so you have to find, you have to find your I rentable in it. And obviously, you can see that it's indexed by uh, position. So, um, well, let's go ahead and make a mock first, right? So now I actually do want to include Trompeloy. Uh, it was what catch to slash Trompeloy. Cool. So now I'm going to need an interface class. So we can have class mock. Okay, so you know we're going to implement I rentable, and of course it is. What well, make mock? Uh, is it mock zero? I need. Come on, it's frozen now. I need the reference here. Where are the tool windows project? Thank you very much. Uh, let's just grab all of these. Go over here. I'm just going to put them in a comment. And do them one more. So make uh, const mock. So const mock means it's a for a const accessible function, obviously. So this is for title. If it stops freezing. Right, so that's one for title. We need to make one for uh, type. Power of Java. Uh, Cosmic Zero for rental star. And that returns a clock time. Right, and I can basically just copy paste that for rental end, can't I? And then we can have one for cost per day. And that returns money, which is our little class here that I made that just has pounds and pence, right? Simple enough. Next, we want the non-con stuff, the mutables. So we'll have make 
mock one mental start void make mock one rental end takes clock time override and done so we've just built a mock right so I can get rid of all this commented rubbish now. That's from the interface. And that's got everything we, we need for an actual mock. So we're going we're to start out obviously fairly simple though, aren't we? So uh, we can create a, uh, actually let's say create these stores and deletes. Then it's going to be a bit more of a useful test, isn't it? So first we want a mock instance of it. So we'll have a mock rentable, come on. Uh, item. Now, I believe there is a uh, require destruction. Yes. Uh, what's wrong with this? Uh, we're missing something. Panel. Uh, I'm missing out a function. Sorry, folks. Uh, I rentable penalty per day. Sorry about that. So I can't mock. Come on, you can do it. Okay, so now it should be good. Hurrah. So we're going to require that it's destructed, right? Makes sense that our mock should require it gets destructed because, well, we specifically state, right, we're going to store it in there and then once we take it to delete it, it should get, get nuked, right? So. Uh, there's a slight problem with our code because at the moment it's not a unique pointer item which is required. Obviously, this requires a unique pointer in order to assign it, right? You've got I rentable, so we'll have to sort that out. So that's easily fixed. We could have auto item equals std make unique mock. So we have mock rentable, and we're just going to make a unique one, right? Cool. And then obviously we need to do that on the underlying item, so we just dereference it in order to require destruction correctly. So now we need an, in an instance of our customer class, so we'll have customer cust pool. Johnny Smith. And we might as well cast it to the interface. Because we can just use that then. So we can have my customer and now we want to pass it in, right? So we can do cast dot assign rental. And why does it keep freezing? Come on. We move the item into it. So now it gets owned, we're moving it over, so we're moving over ownership to the customer, right? And then we can require cust dot, uh, or is it rentals dot size equals one, right? Makes sense. And then assuming that's all passed, we should be able to do cust dot remove rental. Position zero, obviously the first element, and then we can say um, require cast dot rentals dot size zero. Seems like a reasonable set of tests, right? Our mock will verify that it gets destructed correctly. Obviously, it's a little bit. It's fairly guaranteed because it's a unique pointer, right? We're not using any manual memory management here, but it doesn't hurt. We check the size, all that good stuff. So, obviously none of this stuff does anything yet, right? So this is void, so technically I don't need this to do anything. This is also, oh, so interesting, remove rental is passing the object back, right? So I could technically keep it here, but it will get destroyed. Uh, okay, we, we, we could compile it, but I know it will just crash. Let's, let's make it a little bit less useless than that. Um, 
What's the safe way of preventing it crashing? Uh, this can do return nothing. Uh, this is already, what is this? Rentals, return that. And this is void, so it can do nothing anyway. So that won't crash, but it should fail. So if we run the tests, we've completely munged up some code. Uh, what isn't it like here? Uh, could not match to jump jump against mock rent ball can survival. Okay, hold on. Uh, if I only had a browser window, would you kindly? Uh, not very helpful, is it? Oh, here we go. Right. Uh, require of destruction. Here we go. Uh, so you have a pointer to the object. Oh, oh, it's t oh, oh, okay. Fair enough. We can do that. Uh, where is it? There it is. Okay. So you have to include this class in Trompeloy, it turns out. And then I hope this isn't going to mess with the typing, but yeah, thank you very much. You template it on that, and then in theory that works. I will be interested to see how it works with the implementation, but we'll find out. Uh, run. Please don't break my class hierarchy. Yes, cool. All right, so is anyone confused by this bit? It's a trompeloy thing. You have to, if you want to validate that it gets destructed, you have to have this wrapper around it, basically. I didn't include, I just, for convenience, I said using trompeloy def watch. Otherwise, I'd have to write the whole thing out, and that's just annoying. Well, no, I just want the test to be shorter. Um, so, we have a failing test, obviously, that's what we want. Uh, right here, we, well, we didn't satisfy that, right? So let's make that one pass. So, logic would dictate when we assign the rental, we need to shove it in a vector. So I think the sensible thing to do is now have a std vector of unique pointers, oh, come here, unique pointers to i rentables, right? I'll call them rented, right? The stuff we've rented. Uh, rented stuff. Yeah. Oh, we're missing it. Bracket. Brilliant. Okay. So, obviously, this can now just return that. Assign rental. Should move it in. So, item. And we can do rented dot in place. Thank you. So that's fairly obvious, right? So I've made part of it pass. I'm not going to touch remove rental just yet. I'll let that still fail. Well, actually, uh, 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 will it fail though? But will it fail? Actually, yes, it should fail. And what do we get? So on line 78. Last test is, well, we told it to remove the rental, and it didn't. So let's fix that, right? The last part of it. Although we should probably, we should verify the return type, really, shouldn't we? We can 
deal with that later. So we can. Oh, this is gonna be a bit interesting. This is interesting because I've got to shift. I've got to shift the array, right? So let's see. Uh, auto iter equals uh, rented dot begin plus i auto ray equals std move star iter. Come on. Okay. Rented dot arrays iterator. And that is a correct implementation that will shift it down. So anyone want to have a crack at, at, at telling me what exactly it is I've done there? Because it doesn't, it's not the most readable, but I, I, I thought I would make the rentals work like this just to make it a bit more interesting. We get the iterator, so we have the beginning, we increment it by however much they told us. So obviously if it's zero, if it's, zero it's just the first item. Uh, well, so you assign the iterator first, then you move the point, uh, pointer to... So I dereference the iterator. And don't forget, the, 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 the iterator is a vector of std unique pointers to irrentables. So the, when I dereference it, it's going to give me back a unique pointer to irrentable. And then obviously I need to move that object, right? Because it's a reference to it. So I will call std move, and it will move the contents. It will transfer the ownership into this new variable here, leaving the vector with an empty unique pointer at the position of the iterator. And with the race, you remove this And then we remove empty the point. empty item. We remove the empty element. And then we can return the object. So, with that done, if I haven't made any mistakes, it should pass. Ta-da! All right, so that worked nicely. So, we now have a correctly behaving rentals, correctly behaving assigned rentals. Um, I suppose we could do some of the adjust balance stuff, but uh, we probably want to see more mocking, really, don't we? So what's, uh, what's something nice I can do in here that's going to lend itself well to mocking? Mm. What else do we need to test? I could suppose we could crack on with the... I suppose we can test the name and address really quickly, can't we? Um, You mean this? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just paste it in for you. And that should still compile. It's the exact same. Yep, there you go. Uh, they are implemented, they just don't return anything. Because I keep having uh, build errors that the return type doesn't match. You need to fix your return type then. You need to fix your return type then. I'm, I'm compiling because they don't return anything, which means if you call them, you'll crash the program. But they are there. They are all there. Tristan, do you want to give him a hand? I don't write, I don't return the correct value. Oh, you mean you're returning a mismatching type? No, the, the function has no pointers. That's, so it has no return. Yeah, it won't link then. You need to have a definition. That's why I've got a definition, right? I, I, I do have it. So, okay, so let's, let's quickly get some stuff done. So, uh, let's say test case, the rest of customer class is implemented correctly. This is obviously not really a great description of a test case, but we're going to go with it because we're bashing through this. So customer cost impulse 
will be Johnny Smith and human. He's a human, uh, but it doesn't work now because we're missing it. So I need to fix that part. But let's just get that working as well. Uh, we can say uh, check. Come on. Check. I want, it. I want an interface first. Const. Should be that. Check. Start. Come on. Type. Oh, wait, there's no type, there's an address. Uh, one infinite loop. Bonus points to anyone who knows where one infinite loop actually is. Bingo, Apple headquarters. Yes, I would also recommend against repeating strings. It's better if you probably store these in a variable and then reference the variable name. You could obviously technically screw up your test by repeating the strings, but I'm just blasting through it. And also because C line's been a bit laggy. So we've got that. So the caveat now I have is that I actually need the address to work. But the problem is that now all of these aren't going to compile, so I'm kind of left with a dilemma. If I had loads of tests, I would just default this value probably, but since I don't have loads of tests, I'm just going to blank them in order to make it actually compile. So those are all happy. This now takes an address. This is failing. What else do we need to check? Check. Cast dots. Uh, addresses we've done. Uh, well, we need to check their balance, don't we, I suppose? So check cast dot balance. Equals uh, now this is where it's going to get a bit interesting because I don't have valid operands for that, do I? So I'm just going to extend this real quick and we'll add a helper. So we can have uh, operator equals equals cons. Money, can't. Money ref. And oops. we're going to say that return pounds equals other dot pounds and pence equals other. Done. Cool. Equals equals. Sorted. Back to this. Uh, why is that? No, there we go. It's all happy now. Check. Cast. No, oh, no, come on. What else we got? Uh, we did assign rental. That's all sorted. We know that's happy. Uh, balance just did. Remove rentals, done that. Rentals done. Yeah, adjust balance. We didn't do, so let's do that. Uh, I don't want to check it though. I just want to call it first. Uh, let's give them three pound forty six pence. You know, I'm not using floats. When you're dealing with currency or any any kind of numbers like that, don't use floats. Just separate the the, the decimals into different values. Uh, what's this? Let's type cons. Oh, that's my bad. So we've now got just balance. So we can now check cast dot balance. Oh, come on. And you know what? Let's adjust it by a negative number as well. So cast dot adjust. And we're going to do if it loads. There we go. Uh, say minus one and minus uh, 16. So now we can check cast dot pump. Uh, it should be two pounds and thirty pence, right? Come on. Thank you. Okay, so we got a series of things. I think that's basically all of the stuff that's not implemented. We've got just balance. Yeah. 
So just to avoid it crashing, that can do garbage, return nothing. Uh, that doesn't need to return anything anyway. Um, that will need an address for string address. Uh, what else we got? So that's done, that's done. Right, it should fail, but it won't crash. And nope, because I missed one of the constructors. Let's do that again. Cool. So we didn't crash. We did, of course, fail as expected. So the first thing I need to fix is the, the address, right? So that's easily fixed. So we do, we already returning address here, but it's not set. So let's move this down a line because I don't like that. It's taking up too much space. So obviously the, the, the std move is really just for optimization. It's not strictly necessary, but it does make it faster. So that should have fixed the address problem. So we'll just let that run. Come on. Yeah, that's what these warnings are whining about. Uh, I'll have to check them in a minute. Right, so next failure is the money, right? We adjust the balance, doesn't update it. So we can have, uh, well, probably have some money, right? Money balance. So I think that this is a concrete class, and basically it's doing simple stuff. So I think when I, when I increment it, right, We can just do balance plus equals amount. But we can't really, can we? Because no, there's no operator overload, so we need one of them too. So we can have money ref operator plus equals. And we can just take a const money ref for the other side. And no reason to throw an exception, it's all numbers. So we can do pounds, pounds plus equals other dot pounds. Makes sense. Pence plus equals other dot pence. Return star this. Right? Then you can chain them up. So that should be a correct implementation. And Stellaro compiles. So now we can call it just balance. That should work. So, however, the balance is not actually returning it. So let's actually return the amount. And see what we get. That should hopefully have sorted all of that stuff out. Obviously, you don't have to implement the operator overloads. They're all public. You know, pounds and pence is public. You could have implemented it all inside this class. I'm just abstracting it away because it's simple. Uh, no, it looks like I missed something. So what is wrong? Uh, let's see. Failed with my, but, ah, yes, of course. Of course, you know why that's failed, don't you? Because this is undefined. This is undefined behavior. Now it's defined. You could actually, that's, that's, you could just get away with that as well. That's simpler, but I'm going to be explicit. So now that you've initialized it and it's an actual zero, it's all good. We have passed the tests. So at this point, we now have our, our customer class essentially fully tested. It's, it's functioning, right? So then we have our, as it's already provided, there is a video class, as you can see, right? And if I remember rightly, this was implemented for you. So you have some, you can, insta you can instantiate some, some videos, right? So probably not what we want to think about next. Actually, no, what we want to do first is move this stuff out, right? I've done, I've done the class, but now I need to refactor it. So 
did our red or green, now we're going to refactor. So, obviously we first need to create the header file called customer. And we can reference that from both of these. And I'm going to use the old pragma once because it's good enough. Now in test customer, we're going to take our definition of the whole class and we're going to cut it out. Leave that there. Go in here and paste it in. And obviously it's missing a few things, right? So we need to include interface slash my customer for starters. And then what does that fix for us? Pretty much everything. Yeah, in fact, it fixes everything. So we can pop over to test customer. Oh, that's not needed anymore. So we do need the header for our newly implemented class. Right, and if I haven't messed that up, it should compile. I don't need to run it, but it should at least build. Uh, what's this one about? Over in virtual functions. Oh, look at this. This is actually deficient here. Yeah. So this should be override. This should be override. This should be override. So should this. And so should this. I should get rid of our compiler warnings. And so should this. Uh, that's also not true. So we move them around. Let's get rid of the comments. It's all implemented. Okay. So that should be happy. It did compile, right? Yeah, it's all good. So we can go back to this. Uh, sorry, we can go back to this. And we're going to make the implementation. So obviously, just separating it out is fairly simple, right? So we'll take the constructor, move that in here. Done. Thank you very much. We'll take the, if I'll just take a lot of these and do them all together. So cut that off. Just reduce them down to their declarations effectively. And right, so those are all just declarations. We've now got the translation unit. Pop that in there. Then we need to qualify it, so we can take this, paste it in, paste it in. Uh, we don't want virtual, however. In fact, I don't want that in the header at all, so. Back over here. So you don't want override on the definitions. It's just for the declarations. Uh, what's this doing? Indent, indent, indent. And this one. OK. Sorry? Thank you. Right, and as you can see now, that's looking pretty happy. We just need to make sure it's referenced in the translation unit. So we can head over to the CMake lists, and I'm going to break this up onto multiple lines, I think, because it's looking a bit messy. OK, so we've got our test main. Uh, as you can see, we are missing the implementation. So if we just break this up, we have SLC slash 
So now we have the tests, we've included customer. It should still compile even after that. And it does. And if I run it, it should also not fail the test because I haven't changed any code in terms of behavior. I've just moved it around. So, yeah, that's good. That's passed. So at this point, uh, well, I could break into, I could break into uh, implementing the rest of it, but I think we're getting close to 9 o'clock, actually. So, hmm? We've got four minutes, in fact. So, since that is the case, if I can find OBS, and we'll just hop it back to Display Capture 2. Is that working? Ooh, that's freaky. Just uh, display. Come on. Come on. Good. And PowerPoint, please. Jesus, it's laggy. Well. Oh, try that again. Thank you. Right, well, as usual, we're, we're going to be popping to the pub, so if you fancy joining us, uh, please do. And those of you watching online, uh, we will see you next time. Have a good one.